Um, thank you everybody for coming tonight. This was a little bit of a disappointing year for me this last year, because again, I did not make the Greenpeace list of climate criminals. But there's next year, so I'm going Anyway, unlike Greenpeace, I am going to treat this problem seriously. Uh, I would like to offer very quickly eight things that everyone should know about climate change. The first thing, Bill, is that we all know that climate changes continuously. The issue is understanding climate and the role humans play. Let's stop pretending that pictures of polar bears and melting glaciers settle the issue. There is not a debate underway between people who think the climate is changing and people who think it's static. The question is, do we understand how and why it changes? With all due respect to Vice President Gore, the debate about climate science is not over. Many factors influence climate, solar radiation, cloud formation, <coughs> ocean circulation, ocean absorption, volcanoes, vegetation, changes in the Earth's orbit, cosmic rays, anthropogenic greenhouse gases. If we understand the climate system, we have to understand all of these things together and how they influence one another. We cannot simply pick out one of them and we'll pretend that we um, can treat it in isolation. In fact, in all of the climate models that Bill is talking about, feedback is everything. It is not the impact of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. It is the impact of carbon dioxide on the other parts of the climate system that is an issue. That science is simply not understood. It is merely assumed. And unfortunately, all the climate models used by the IPCC have a tendency to make identical assumptions. Until we get the science right, climate models will continue to have zero predictive ability. The models couldn't predict the temperature rise in the 90s. They couldn't predict the temperature flattening in uh, the last 10 years. They couldn't predict the big ice melt in 2008, 2007, 2008. They couldn't predict the restoration of the ice. They can't predict anything. The Kyoto Protocol, <laughs> which we so desperately need to succeed with the treaty, is embarrassing. We are a policy community and we ought to insist on substance, transparency, and honesty. Instead, we got a treaty designed to be clever and effective. Careful selection of 1990 is the base year, although the treaty was signed in 1997 largely fictitious trading systems, and zero carbon reduction. And I want to show you a specific example of this. This shows how the EU-15 proposes to meet their Kyoto targets. Um, from the base year in 1990 to the final year of 2012, they agreed to an 8% reduction, which is roughly 340 million tons a year of CO2 equivalent. Okay. If you look at their websites, they'll tell you we're right on track to meet our commitments. Now, how have they done it? Well, the first thing, interestingly enough, is that since the base year was 1990, between 1990 and 97, both the British and the Germans made a very sensible decision to shut down their very expensive, inefficient, labor-wracked coal industries and replace them with natural gas. Perfectly sensible thing to do. Nothing to do with climate change and virtually nothing to do with the environment. It was a political imperative. So by the time they signed the paper, two-thirds of their um, objective had been met. Nice, nice deal. Flexible mechanisms. Trades with the former Soviet Union countries. And this uh, horrible mess that's become the clean development mechanism, which allows countries to make investments in developing countries most of which turn out to have no actual impact on carbon dioxide emissions. And then finally, of course, carbon sinks. Uh, carbon sinks make perfectly good sense in principle. Forest management can, in fact, increase carbon capture. But the way these are defined in Kyoto, governments are allowed basically to put down on paper anything that they find has a positive impact and ignore the things that they find that have a negative impact. So um, that's how the EU is meeting their target. Now, what's missing from this list? Oh, yeah, greenhouse gas reductions, OK? What is the amount of greenhouse gas reduction in the EU 15 between 1997 and today? It's positive, OK? So what they've done is they've taken on a commitment, and they're going to meet it by purely by accounting tricks. The purpose of this was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and they've done none of it. 
give you the same analysis for Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand. Okay? Now, the attitude of the Europeans to the United States seems to be, well, maybe we don't keep our promises, but at least we make them. <laughs> <laughs> now, the OECD countries are not the problem. Yes, it's true that we have put most of the carbon into the atmosphere to date. This chart shows the DOE's forecast of global carbon emissions. And if we're going to keep carbon emissions flat, not let alone the deep reductions that Bill talks about, we're going to have to take that much out of the system. That's about three quarters of what the OECD uh, group is likely to emit. And we still cling to this view that the developing countries should have no binding emissions targets. And as long as the uh, developing countries are not in the picture, you cannot make the numbers add up. Now, developing countries care about poverty, not climate change. You know, all I can say about China's on board, India's on board, everybody's got a, got a plan is you have got to be kidding. <laughs> Those countries have shown zero interest in anything other than coming to the table and getting a handout from the Western countries. Now, President Obama apparently likes the European model because that's the way we're headed with Waxman Markey that passed in the House and Kerry Boxer that's currently in the Senate. Let's take a look at this. This chart shows the U.S. Uh, reference case CO2 emissions from the Department of Energy. And this is the Kerry Boxer bill. Reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 3% by 2012, 20% by 2020, then 42%, 75%. <coughs> Pretty big uh, reduction. Just what Bill has in mind. Now, here's what's going to happen. You'll notice that they, again, cleverly picked a high base here in 2012. And we'll go for several years if this monstrosity passes, uh, spending a lot of money. These bills have massive loopholes, lots of foreign offsets, uh, limits on the price of carbon. Uh, some industrial sectors will get their emissions uh, rights handed to them. Some will have to pay for them. So there's already a lobbying frenzy in Washington about who gets the freebies and who has to pay. There will be massive self-congratulation. All these people will stand up and say, this is the year that we uh, stop the seas from rising. And then, of course, as the targets begin to bite and potentially hurt the economy, Congress will do what it always does. They'll put them off or waive them. Okay? That is never the one. <laughs> we have to understand, folks, that no Congress can pass a law that binds future Congresses. What these people seem to want to do is to take the credit and then defer the hard decisions to somebody else who will have to put them off. Now, governments refuse to acknowledge the real trade-offs. This is not so interesting as Professor Newmont suggests. Trivial carbon reductions are easy, but meaningful carbon reductions are difficult and costly. We like to play the game up here because that's easy. But governments are going to have to be much more honest with people about what severe carbon reductions will involve. Now, the Copenhagen draft, and it is still a draft, it's got lots of alternative language in it, contains several landmines that we don't want to step on. The first one is this concept of climate debt, where the developed countries accept historical responsibility for disproportionate use of shared global carbon space. Most historians know that in 1919, the victors of World War I sat the, the, everybody down at the uh, Treaty of Versailles and forced the Germans to take guilt for the war and pay reparations. This is the first time in history that the most powerful and rich nations in the world have sat everybody down and demanded to accept the blame themselves and to pay reparations to everybody else. No wonder the developing countries are rushing to the table. <laughs> Secondly, for the first time that I have ever seen in a treaty, we're talking about the establishment of a global government. When you see this word, watch out, particularly when it's got provisions for self-financing through international taxes. There are several provisions. This is one of them. If we give a United Nations organization permanent status and taxing capability, you're giving governmental powers to an organization that is undemocratic, unaccountable, and utterly corrupt. The only people who will be happy with this will be the Swiss, because that's where most of the money will be. Yeah. <laughs> so My nightmare is that the U.S. accepts the principle of climate debt. We get a self-financing U.N. government status, but nobody does anything about greenhouse gases. Acceptable to me is meeting insurance with no result, and my dream is that honesty breaks out. And governments accept that carbon emissions cannot be addressed by either ineffective treaties or limitations on economic growth. This is very unlikely, but I can always dream. Thank you very much.